Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have Claudia Marx, Senior Art Director at Getty Images, as tonight's guest speaker. Claudia is a native New Yorker. She graduated with a BFA in photography from Parsons. In previous years, Claudia was photo director at Parade Magazine and worked as a freelance art director and producer for HGTV and Oprah. Other clients include InStyle, Self, and Interview Magazines, where she worked with David LaChapelle, Herb Ritz, and Karl Lagerfeld, among others. Claudia currently works as senior art director at Getty Images. Her role is to provide creative direction to a roster of contributing photographers and videographers across the US helping generate high-end commercial creative content. Uh, word to the wise, Claudia is always looking for new talent, so talk to her after the lecture. <laughs> uh, and please help me welcome Claudia Marx to our lecture series. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Claudia Marx. I work at Getty Images, and thank you all for coming out. I know it's a miserable day, and I really appreciate it. Um, I'm very honored to be here. I'm here tonight. I also changed the slide for you guys and changed everything to be recent, but I want it to be warm and springy, so that's why I put that there, so hopefully that helps today. Um, I'm here to talk about how to maybe, how you could, as a photographer or creator, explore your passion, your photography, but also maybe make some money from it. I mean, when you're in school, I don't know, maybe now they talk more about it. I don't think it's in our school they did. When I, was, when I was younger, we talked, you know, a lot about the work and how to create it and how technically to do it. But, um, you know, I, I've, I've worked in, in magazine publishing for 25 years. I worked with so many different genres of photography and different kinds of photographers. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's an industry. But uh, the thing I respected most was the people who really just stuck to their guns and they did themselves and they did their work um, the way that they wanted to do it. But it still was something that was in demand and still made money and that's um, an important thing that you eventually learn if you want to continue to make photography your life and make it as make it a business and make some money off of it. So um, I know that everyone um, you know probably has heard of stock photography and has heard of Getty Images and you know have a certain way of thinking about it. Um, but they may not realize exactly what it's for and what it is. It's not always just, you know, women eating salad. There's a lot to it. It's authentic, high quality, fully released, model released and property released imagery. Ideally, maybe not all the time, but that definitely is a, the most, um, what the ideal of what we want it to be. Um, but it's basically renting. It's basically like a client, an advertising agency wants to use an image for a specific amount of time and they pay a certain price based around that time that amount of time in that sort of area of where they want to use it for. Um, agencies um, will use stock photography because they don't, either don't have time, a lot of it is, is a time issue, and a lot of it is a money issue. Even though sometimes these images will go for a lot of money, they still cost a lot less than producing a whole shoot from scratch and hiring models and production and everything like that. So they can also be delivered and purchased online, so they can be used right away if someone has an ad campaign on Instagram or on Facebook, which is you know, very much in demand right now. Um, it's it, it runs the gamut, basically. So, I mean, based on what I've seen that what we have in our collection, I truly believe that you can explore your ideas and explore your, um, your concepts and the things that you want to do and still kind of have it speak to paying clients um, without really sacrificing what you're trying to say. We work with a lot of people um, who just kind of follow their passion and follow what they do um, and then consult with us about what they, how to make that saleable work. Um, so I'm going to have a couple of examples, a bunch of stuff through here that kind of shows you stuff that was stock photography and then how it was used in an, in an ad. Um, this is an image by someone named Jim Naughton. It was actually shot in 2001. Um, you know, the thing is, it's an opportunity. He made it, saw an opportunity to make a comment about the height of a giraffe, which could be a metaphor for so many different things. And, you know, the client, Postbank, saw that it meant something having to do with interest rates, I guess. I'm not yeah. sure. Um, interest rates. So, um, but beyond this one ad, it's been used a ton. It's one of the highest selling images that we have. Um, this is another shoot that, if you can see towards the bottom there, the sort of other alternate images from the same shoot. You know, I don't 
think that they necessarily thought specifically that this would this woman would be the poster girl for a story about sexism um, and what to do about it. But you know, the, he just did some beautiful portraits of a Hispanic woman, because that's one of the subjects that we said we have. We're very much in demand, so um, you know, he's working on his portrait skills and took some beautiful imagery that we have up on the site. And a client found it, the Huffington Post, and used it. Um, this is I have a couple of examples of footage in here. Um, this is a commercial. I'm going to show you. It's the, the majority of this commercial is stock footage, and the majority of it is ours. And the vast majority of the people shooting this had no idea that they were shooting this with the goal of it being in an ad for a cruise company. Um, they really just sh were probably experimenting with shooting with drones or shooting in different angles and shooting different amazing things that they saw be in front of them. Um, and all these clips, a lot of these are belong to us, but I think the majority of them do. Anyway, I'll let you take a look. So that was most of that was stock footage, and probably you know not understanding what the end game was, but it expressed a lot of things um, that probably the company wanted to um, to show in their ad. Um, this is another um, point I'd like to make about user-generated content that is probably who you're competing with out in the marketplace. Unfortunately, or fortunately, because I, I personally think that you guys are in the best position to create the best looking user generated content. The catch would be to put it in a place where it can be syndicated properly and not just swiped off of your Instagram or your YouTube account. So, um, looking at this ad again, it, there, there's a prob probably a bunch of it that was probably created by people who are semi pros or pros, but um, you'll see the whole point of the ad is that it's, um, you know, friends trust friends. <laughs> This is a recent ad that I just found, and I find it so weird because a lot of it is so not good looking um, in that way that I think everyone would try to do um, in this room. But it's this is what's this is a ad. I think it's I think it's running nationally or at least on the East Coast. So um, these clips I, ideally theoretically were purchased for a lot of money. Um, so basically, how do you know? How, if you, how your work fits in. How do you know if you're going to be able to spin your work into a successful career? Um, I think it comes down, you have to kind of think about the fact that there are so many photographers and visual artists. There are people who are creating content. Our kids are creating content that is available online that can be purchased. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of insane at this point. So you're competing for the same jobs as you know, 16-year-olds, 18-year-olds, as you know, people in the industry forever. So the the it's the the marketplace has opened up so big. So you have to find a way to differentiate yourself. And I personally think that the best way to do that is to really follow follow your passion, follow the thing that you really want to explore, um, whether it's you know, landscapes or whether it's fashion. Um, these are these are all images that are in our collection. Um, whether it's doing a personal story about the gay rodeo, which is this is um, from Britt Worgan, um, or working with multimedia and figuring out what that might say to someone, say to a client. But the things that these all have in common is they speak to sort of um, to, to different concepts that um, advertisers and clients might be inspired by. And the work is of such high quality that it can um, 
you know, that it, it would prompt people to really, to, to move people to create an ad around it or to use in their ad. So, you know, you're shooting tons of images, you're exploring what you're passionate about and you want to make a living out of it. Um, it may not happen right away, you may not find your niche, but I, I personally think that the best way to, to go about this is maybe um, if, if you were to come with Getty or look at the information that we have, um, you know, we're, we talk a lot about the visual trends and we talk about what's in demand in the marketplace and that is valuable information for anybody at any level of their career, I think. So, um, you know, these are, you find out the things that are needed by clients. Um, so this is just some more of our work that's recent. Um, you know, Tim Flack is a very famous animal photographer. Um, this is a project that was shot in Mongolia. Um, but people shoot all kinds of things. They shoot what they what they either what they're what they have the budget to go do, what they're doing for a job, or just what's in front of them, like their family or their friends. Um, you know, but they they look for ways to kind of express that and and just really create work and 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 we work as editors to to pick out what might work best in the collection. Um, this is another ad that I wanted to show because it's such a simple idea that I think, I feel like anyone really experimenting with video, and I think you should all be experimenting with video, um, creating a really simple, emotional, beautiful um, image in a, in a very, very simple way. I mean, this could, could have been stock footage. I don't know if it was. I don't think it was. Is mankind? Are we good? Go see. Go look through their windows so you can understand their views. Sit at their tables so you can share their tastes. Sleep in their beds so you may know their dreams. Go see and find out just how kind the he's and she's of this mankind are. So, um, so that's the kind of footage that, um, you know, also in terms of stills and stuff, uh, that is kind of inspired by your everyday stuff. So you could create fine art, you could go high concept. A lot of the vast majority of what people are looking for kind of comes out of what we experience around ourselves. So that kind of footage um, or stills could be could you know be done by anyone with the, with your kids or with their nieces or nephews or at home for the holidays um, to just kind of take a few minutes and, and shoot what's around them because those are the most valuable most authentic moments um, these are some more imagery from our uh, more recent collection a couple of these things are in our lean in collection which is a collection we did with um, Cheryl Sandberg which seeks to repicture how women are portrayed in the workplace um, you know and we're exploring ideas like diversity and um, same-sex um, couples and families, blended families, and moms working at home. Um, but these are just these are things that happen around you every day. So these are not huge, giant productions um, that you have to spend a ton of money on. These are things you could probably shoot on your own time or you know when you feel like it, um, and just keeping the ideas and the concepts in mind. So um, some of the concepts that you might want to think about, you know. Um, Families, celebrations, business, friendship, technology. Um, these are all broad, broad concepts that can be, could be interpreted in many different ways. You could, you know, be traveling and you could shoot a celebration, like a private birthday party or something. We have several photographers who basically have whole careers revolving around just shooting their kid and their wife and their family, um, you know, doing their everyday stuff. Um, but you know, it's about trying to find those moments that become really iconic that clients will want to buy. Um, this is a this is actually an art series by a photographer named Ken Herman, which probably speaks more towards technology or you know inspiration or innovation. Um, but it could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, but it's just an example of an, another kind of work that you know a series of work that a photographer did that is in our collection um, that you know might work for a ton of different agencies, different agencies and different um, businesses. Um, 
so once you've got the sort of general ideas down about what you're shooting, you want to link, think about the concepts that you apply to them. And this is how we sort of choose the best images and how we choose the, um, to really narrow down which images are going to work for clients. So these are some very broad evergreen ideas that, um, that connect the images to clients and to things that they're looking for. Um, but they can really be interpreted very broadly or they could be interpreted very literally. Um, you know, so really, really basic stuff like love, communication, connection, community, innovation, cooperation, and, you know, at the base of it all, authentic moments, which is something that's come up so much in the past um, few years from what I understand. Um, so a couple more uses examples. Um, this is a shoot that we talk about a lot at Getty. Um, it is, it was a big production. This is someone who spends their life doing tons of stock imagery, does really well at it, and um, you know you can see it was up on the site and we keyword it, that's how clients find the imagery. Um, and it was turned out to be the perfect thing that Crate and Barrel needed for their, their um, campaign for that contest. Um, and this is a more recent use, this is a photographer who was actually with iStock, but he's mirrored on the Getty site, um, and he shoots tons and tons of travel stuff, and his image was used um, on the Amex landing page in Italy because he shoots tons of um, travel stuff in Italy and Paris and all over Europe. Um, the thing that all these images have in common that's sold to these larger clients um, is that they're model and property released. Um, and that's probably the, m the most important thing that I encourage everyone to learn how to do and how to ask um, people to sign releases and how to um, get those releases organized. I realize it's not possible every single time and there are lots of situations that you probably don't need releases, um, but it's, it's, it's definitely a good habit to get into. You want to be able to indemnify yourself as well as whatever eventual client buys the image. Even if you're not planning on signing with Getty, I think it's something that I think photographers need to learn to do um, in general, in this, especially in this world. Um, you know, even if someone swiped your image and used it against your will in an ad, the, the model or whoever's in the image could come after you for letting that happen, even if you didn't control that situation. So it helps to have a little bit of backup um, if you need it in the future. Um, so I am going to talk now about our Creative in Focus, which is a um, trend guide that we at Getty put out every year. This is the two 2017 version. Um, the link there is where you can actually download the entire book. And what I'm showing you here is just going to be the trends that are included in it. Every year we include about six trends. They're cultural and visual trends. And um, there's a lot more in the book, actually, though. It's a lot of um, great essays and great information about um, where we collectively think that the marketplace is going right now. So it's something that helps our um, creators and our clients um, think about where their work is going and where um, you know you could you know what, what, what you might want to create next and where your work might fit into Getty. Um, and it's, it's created by all the art directors and um, visual trends people, pretty much everyone in the creative department across the globe. We work with our office in London and our office in Seattle, and we all talk and um, we hash out these trends. It takes a few months to make. So um, the first trend I'm going to just briefly touch on is the virtuality. Um, everyone's seen, like in the user-generated ad, um, the sort of POV shots, um, but also getting into creating those gosh, I forget the word, quadrilateral. Um, those images that could be, that's actually, I think, a, a 360 image if you were to view it on the right device. Um, but creating 360, 360 imagery and virtual reality imagery. Um, but that's you know, something that's definitely happening across the industry. Um, a lot of brands and a lot of clients are looking for that work. If it's just a still photo, it's something that really pulls you in and immerses you into whatever the activity is. Um, even if it's something beyond travel, it could be, you know, from the point of view of a baby, you know, walking around the house or, you know, putting a camera on your dog um, and have it, have explore its day, have you explore its day. Um, but, you know, it could also be as extreme as skydiving or, um, you know, surfing and stuff like that. Um, but there's a lot of, um, that is something that's very much in demand right now and people are looking for. Um, the second trend is about color. If any of you look at a lot of fashion work and stuff like that, you'll see that there's a lot more um, imagery out there where the story is really about color and it's not even about the fashion or about the photographer. For the photography, it's almost a painting and it's really just about 
either monochrome, either pastel colors or super bright saturated colors. Um, there's been a lot of campaigns and a lot of um, fashion work and um, imagery around that is just embracing color in a really big way and it's like the star of the image. Um, the third trend we have is called unfiltered, which I think fits into a lot of what I, I hope everybody shoots when they're shooting for their Instagram or they're shooting just for fun and maybe they're not even posting it, but um, it's just talking about people who dare to be different and sort of embrace radical transparency and um, you know just kind of being who they are and owning it. It's about real bodies. It's about um, you know unfiltered moments that is you know it's 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 about Gen Z and millennials, um, which I'm sure everyone's sick of hearing about, but that's still something that ever brands are talking about and gearing their campaigns to. So they want it to look like the kind of stuff that kids shoot. Um, so if you guys are already shooting this work, um, there's a lot more to this, um, which I could talk about at another privately. Um, but there's a lot more to this, and it's basically, um, you know, just kind of off the hip going back to analog and going back to like shooting just, you know, without even um, thinking about it too much, but still getting really powerful, interesting, almost feeling a little bit behind the scenes imagery. Um, the next trend is called Gritty Woman. It is um, kind of the extension of our Lean In campaign um, in that this is about badass women. This is, you know, going from like Madonna, um, I was going to say Madonna because that's how old I am, um, Beyonce and, um, you know, just women being badass, Amy Schumer, people like that, but just really getting dirty and getting in there and, you know, bleeding and sweating and, and just, you know, really just, you know, breaking down barriers and just being, you know, really tough as nails um, and just sort of showing that. So, you know, it's not happy polished woman eating salad. It's, you know, woman moving a boulder or, you know, having running a triathlon or something. So it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, the next trend is global neighborhood. It's a little bit harder to define, so it's kind of open to a lot of interpretation, but it's basically talking about, um, you know, cultural identity, globalization, how um, increasingly more and more, and those of you that travel a lot probably realize this if you go to places, you know, you suddenly see in the most unexpected places people with smartphones and people with iPods and people with iPads and, you know, places where you normally wouldn't expect it. You say, oh, I'm in the third world and maybe they're not, um, you know, using those things typically, but now they're everywhere, you know, but also sort of um, cultural trends and not, not cultural appropriation, but more like, how um, people are really taking things and making it their own and it's turning into something else. So it's not simply like a girl at a festival in a, in a Native American headdress. It's about um, kind of blending it into their, into their own culture, you know, where maybe someone's wearing a hijab and they're, you know, doing it in a really unique way that has a nod to Western, Western style. Um, and then the last trend is called New Naivete. Um, and it's kind of about the really absurd moments in life and kind of, um, you know, I think the thing that I think a lot of people try to, the sort of funny stuff that you'd shoot on your Instagram or, um, or just if you were to shoot that kind of stuff, but the sort of unusual, weird looking, strange things that people do, showing people really being human and really kind of being irreverent, but also just kind of owning it and kind of like being silly and being great. Um, it's kind of, a po kind, of, kind of a positive spin on the unfiltered thing. Um, and from there, uh, if you want to see more, there is our Getty Images Instagram, which is the creative Instagram, not the main one, um, where we feature just all of this work and more um, and tell you a little bit about it and tell you where to find it if you want to see more of it. But it's a really gorgeous, gorgeous feed. Um, the um, person, uh, my colleague who curates it, does a really beautiful job of making it all sort of color themed. And so as you scroll down the feed, um, it's like a, a gorgeous rainbow of, of imagery. It's kind of great. Um, and then last but not least, if you want to work with us, these are some great places to go. Community Assignments is, um, you know, if you just want to dip a toe in, it's a great place to sort of dive in and take a look at um, group, sort of where we're crowdsourcing imagery for clients. Um, so they're very specific assignments that are geared towards clients, so they have a very specific brief. Um, so it might be interesting to sort of take a look at the kinds of things that were needed there. 
Um, work with us this is more of a general place where you can upload a, co upload a portfolio and some images and really learn a little bit about what it's like to work with us. And then my email address if you want to get in touch with me directly. And that is all. I'm sure there's a lot of questions okay. for you. Uh, so I'll pass around the mic. It's not going to make your voice louder. Please use it for the video, okay? So happy to take questions. Hi, Claudia. Thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, I'm curious as to, to know when you put out a creative brief to your photographers, uh -huh. uh, how wide do you usually get in terms of like, uh, d um, do you usually put that out to a, 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 a large number of photographers that you have uh, on the roster or maybe have things that, uh, that you have in mind for a specific <laughs> piece? Well, um, there's different, I mean, we have, um, the, when you join Getty, you get access to the creative, the contributor community. And in the contributor community, there's a section called Brief, the Brief section that gets updated every day, every week, um, at least every week, if not every two weeks, where we add things that are specifically client needs, and they're very broad, and they go to everybody who has access to the contributor community. Um, I have a roster of photographers that I work with directly um, that's not huge, but it's... Um, you know, decently sized, and you know, anyone who communicates with me and says I'm going to Cuba, or I'm, I'm going wherever, I might give them um, some ideas towards that. Um, or if they just want are working on a project, um, I'll work more specifically down to specific briefs revolving around what they're already working on. I mean, the people that I work with directly, I'm more likely to say, let's work within what you're already shooting. Let's try to make it work. You know, let's talk about how we can make it work within within, which is what everyone should be doing anyway. But you know, if you're there's a lot of photographers that are with us that we can't work with on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and who also just don't want to work on a one-on-one -on -one basis. They just want to do it themselves, and that's fine too. Um, they can go and get the brief, and anyone can do it. Um, surprisingly few actually do it. Most people, I think, just shoot what they feel like shooting and just submit it. I think more people should probably go to the briefs. And we encourage people to do that. And there's a lot of tools on the site um, to help anyone who's not assigned to a, an art director to get information, feedback, portfolio reviews. Also, um, we also have a shoot brief tool where anyone can go in, anyone who's a contributor can have access to, and they can go on and put on the details of the shoot that they're planning and when they're shooting it and what they want to do. And they can ask specific questions about to get advice from an art director. And it gets picked up by one of the art directors um, on the team and you, they have about two weeks to get back to you um, and have a dialogue with you about um, you know, whatever shoot you're planning and how to make it saleable and any advice and stuff like that. You can upload swipes and you know, upload inspiration images and you know, get real feedback on your shoot from an art director. So there's a lot of different ways, depending on how you work. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, I'd like to know about model releases, um, both for people you work with and also maybe candid of strangers, I'm thinking most people would be wary of having their image just appear wherever. Yeah. And do you offer to pay people? I mean, how do you convince people that this is something that would benefit them as well? Well, that how do you just get them to sign the release? <laughs> I think it depends on the situation. And I think, you know, if you're shooting on the street and you're shooting a portrait of someone on the street, it helps to get the release and it's just sort of a protection against like, you know, saying, yes, I have your permission to shoot this image. Um, I suggest most people tell, tell their subjects, you know, you're not getting paid for this. This is just your portfolio. This is just what's working for it. You know, if it's someone that you're close with or a model that you've hired, you could also make a deal with them about, well, if this does sell for something, I will give you X amount of money or I will give you X percentage. And, you know, but that's, there's no way of predicting what's going to, it really is, we try really hard to predict our trends and predict the things that are going to sell, but there's really no way to predict because a client comes along and then, like I said, they want a bear with a donut and, you know, thank God we have it, but maybe they don't want that bear, I don't know. So, it, you just ha kind of have to play it on a case-by-case -case basis. It just helps protect you and them. But you have to, I guess, be transparent with someone on the street. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm sorry. The other, the other, the other thing I wanted to say was is that you could also spin it as, um, 
you know, you want to be able to get in touch. The, the model release that we use, that you should use, has their contact information, and you want to be able to get in touch with them if it does sell and say, like, I want to be able to get in touch with you to let you know, and then we can work something out, but I don't know if it's going to sell. Okay. You know. Hi. Sure. Hi. 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 Uh, along with that, I'm not familiar with a property release. A property release is if you're in a in a in a location like inside someone's house or a school or someplace, um, and you can recognize that place. Like you know, I'm going to see this whole classroom, so I know this is SVA, and SVA is going to have a problem with me selling an ad to another school because mm -hmm. I've shot a class in a classroom. They need you need a release saying you know that it's okay to shoot in that, or if it's a dog. Or that's a model, that's a working dog or something, or you know, a specific car or a specific, um, you know, you need the owner of the copyright of whatever that object is. So we have a wiki also on the contributor community that tells you about designer chairs and certain specific locations. The general rule of thumb is if you have to pay to get in, in any way, shape, or form, you probably need a release. You definitely need a release, property release. Mm -hmm. That was pretty much my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. You, you've almost, I think you've touched on it, but very slightly. Um, your, the releases that you did show uh -huh. on your screen, uh -huh. your presentation, they're the way they're formatted, is that formatted by Getty? And are that is our, that is our release. That's your release. Those are our releases. You could also, I always suggest to people, there's an app called Easy Release that you can get on your phone that basically fills all this out for you and you can literally have the person sign on your phone or your iPad or whatever with their finger um, and fill it all in um, but it's it, but it covers the same information but this is it, it's our release but it's a pretty standard right. everything because it covers compensation it covers all the bases it's not just that simple one pa short paragraph that I've seen everyone use a really the, the standard one that I think is from a million years ago <laughs> Right. I have Sorry. another question. Sure. Yeah, uh, if one was to go with uh, Getty Images, uh, what kind of percentage on sales do you offer your photographers? It depends on where you put your imagery. We have uh, rights managed and royalty free models. The rights managed uh, model will get you 40% of whatever the sale price is, and the royalty free is 20%, right? Um, the, the, the difference is rights managed is um, a very specific model that is, for example, someone, a client will come and ask you for, they'll ask us for, they want to use this image in a campaign for six months in Germany, whatever. Um, and then that image gets taken off the site and then no one else can use it and it may not sell again because it's been used once, maybe in a big campaign, so pretty much anyone in Germany is going to ask, has it ever been used before? If it's a competitor, it's not going to get used again. Um, so it's a very limited sales clientele that you're getting because that market is going away, kind of. I mean, we still have kind of a base amount of people. The royalty-free model right now is what everyone's kind of clamoring for, and even though the percentage rate is lower on that, the opportunity for the images to sell more than one time is huge because um, the way um, a lot of agencies are working right now and a lot of clients are working is, you know, they're doing stuff in-house. They're doing stuff that's quick. They don't know what they want. They just want to be able to download whatever. They don't even know if they're going to use it. So they just click a button and they buy it. They want this instant gratification. So you're in a better position if you have high-quality work in the royalty-free model because people are just going to look at it and go, that's amazing, and they'll just buy it, even if they don't know if they're going to use it right away. Well, is some of that determined by your clients who buy who, or lease... I guess it's leasing the imagery. Yeah. Uh, would they determine uh, which category you, uh, the photographer's work would fall into? No, the, based the, on no, the no. So the clients image? just go on the main site and look for imagery, and they look for either royalty free or rights managed. They don't tell the, pho the photographers where to put their stuff. If a photographer insists on putting all stuff in, in royalty free, and there's definitely, I mean, in rights managed, there's definitely a certain photographer, photo certain photography that sits in that model because it really just shouldn't be anywhere else. It's not going to be saleable anywhere else. But anything that's sort of like the really broad, like family, uh, those kind of imagery, business imagery, that's the kind of stuff you want to have in royalty free because it'll just sell like crazy if it's really, really good. 
So you've shown some work that you said was like personal work that mm -hmm. people have done. Um, so I'm curious about this relationship. If you have work that you want, you know, exhibited in a gallery or mm -hmm. shown somewhere, how does that work in relationship to s to kind of selling it as stock? And do, does it does it mean that if it gets used, you you're sort of limited in what you can do with your own work? And also, uh, is there any control that the photographer retains in terms of like? politically, morally, ethically, like where it gets used? Um. Yeah, um, not really. I mean, they'll just starting working backwards. You, um, you can put restrictions in your work if you don't want it used in a certain industry, and that usually makes more sense if, say, you've shot, say you've shot some imagery for a hotel <laughs> campaign or for a cruise line, for example, and you, they paid for this ad campaign, but you have all these outtakes or the ad campaign's over, and you, you should retain the rights to your imagery afterwards. And you want to just put, place it with Getty because now it's just languishing on a hard drive. Um, you can restrict it to say it can't be sold again for that industry because it's already been used in a campaign for that industry, and that's the deal I made with my client. Um, in terms of like morally, politically, I, I, we we don't have a way of of, of limiting that, and it kind of wouldn't make sense because you probably are limiting yourself in terms of the sales. Um, so I usually advise people that that just we can't do that. Like we can't just you can't put a list of like companies that you're against politically and then you know you, that your imagery can't be sold to them unfortunately and about the personal work the personal work um we can do stuff like limit whether or not posters are made you know whether you know make you can whether we can sell because we have we have also part of our business is photos.com and so we do prints and have them we can sell fr framed prints of people's work and so we can limit that we can put that restriction I like that first opening image is um, Gabrielle Paratory Penn and she limited that work so that we don't we're not allowed to sell it on on photos.com so we're not allowed to sell prints of it framed prints of it because she sells that in galleries because hmm? she has it because she has an edition and she has it in galleries and stuff. So she put her gallery rights to work up and we put a restriction on it that it can't be sold for framed prints, basically. But beyond that, if it gets used in an ad or whatever, I mean, that just benefits her. It's her choice to put it up. You can also, I mean, the, 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 the fact that you retain the copyright and we're just basically acting like a broker for you, you have the opportunity to pull the images as well. I mean, we don't advise it, and it's hard to do, especially if clients are about to buy it and they have it in their cart, and we don't like pulling stuff like that willy-nilly, like all over the place. But um, if, if, if there's some good reason to pull something for some reason, like you have some private client that just wants to own it, you know, you could pull it. It can be pulled. Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit about royalty-free pricing? It how, how does a client pay for something? If it's royalty free, it sounds like it's free. Yeah, I know, but that's not what it is. It's really not. So how does that work now? It's I know now it used to be, you know, there used to be discs that you could buy yeah. for $200 and then you could use anything on them. I'm right. sure that's no longer a No, model. now it's based on the size of the download. So if a client wants to use it on a website and they only need a 72 DPI, then they pay a lower price than someone who needs a 300 DPI large image for their So it's a flat rate campaign. based on flat file size? Flat rate based size? on size. Mm -hmm. okay. But it's not free. I mean, the client can per can download it, and the fact is they're buying this model that they could ideally use it over and over again, but no one does that. I mean, everyone says that, but I've worked in places on the other side where I've downloaded tons of, like, silhouetted images of spices, and we literally would never use them again. My art directors would always go find other stuff that they wanted to use. So it seems scary. It seems like, oh, I'm handing them this image to use endlessly. Um, but no one ever really does that. They actually, I think what happens more is people buy stuff, download stuff, and they don't think about it and they may not end up using it, but they just buy it anyway. So it's these weird incremental purchases that seem a little bit like, like strange, like why is someone buying my image for so little? But the thing, the, the truth is, is the industry right now is so um, big and, di and also, but also diluted in a way in that you know, you're not just buying an ad campaign that's going to run for six months. You're going to buy an image for Instagram. You're going to buy an image to run on your Facebook for a day. You know, you're going to buy an image for your, even for an ad campaign that turns into a commercial. Like, I don't know, that, I, that Palm Beaches commercial, for all I know, is only running in New York City. So they may not have even paid as much as I would think that they would want to pay. But um, it's going to depend on where that ad's running and for how long and how many eyeballs are going to see it. And surprisingly, a lot of stuff runs for very short times in very limited markets because the technology allows them to do that. You know, it allows them to create a whole ad because they have an intern who sits there and works on Final Cut and 
cobbles this ad together. You know. Hi. Hey. So you have the mobile the, on the model release and the property release. What would you do? Cause street art's such a big part of the way that mm -hmm. people photograph now. Um, I've heard situations where art, like street artists have come after people and been like, well, we didn't want our art used in You mean X, like y, graffiti and, and stuff like yeah. that? Yeah, we tell people not, we just don't accept it. Like, I mean, I think there's an image Jamie was trying to submit that like, I, I was like, I can't, it's got a giant piece of graffiti on it. We just, we don't accept graffiti unless it's property released. And we have, we actually have had people get property releases from street artists, from murals and stuff like that. So it's possible if you know the artist, if you can track them down. Um, but if it's not possible, then we would say, don't show it, or if it's like a tag or something that you can alter in Photoshop, then I would say alter it. Um, Claudia, perhaps you can talk a little bit about that other scenario where um, Crate and Barrel mm -hmm. bought uh, a big production. Oh, okay, I know I took, I took that down. That was a bigger, bigger story from my other presentation. Um, so this image has a whole backstory to it. I mean, all the images have a backstory. They're all going to be created in a certain way. But basically, um, you know, the ad agency that works with Crate and Barrel, you know, a lot of our bigger clients work with our visual trends department to talk about the kinds of imagery that they're looking for for their campaign. And they hunt for it for a long time because these things are planned in advance. So, um, you know, they were talking to us about they wanted a celebration, they wanted it to be outdoors, they wanted it to be warm and beautiful. So, you know, we, you know, knew that that was something that was in demand from this one specific client, but also we knew that that was just generally in demand that other clients were looking for it. So one of our more seasoned photographers who works, just shoots tons for us, Thomas Barwick, um, and his art director, Amy, um, planned out a whole shoot and they got their tear sheets and they figured out what they wanted it to look like. They figured out what kind of models, how many models they wanted to do. Um, Thomas, I think, had a producer find a farmhouse like a, who has like a working farm and had a whole family together. And they got all these people together um, and basically set up a real catered dinner and had this family come. They told everyone just to wear white. Um, and they just basically had an entire dinner. And if you look at the rest of the shoot online, you'll see that there's um, all kinds of imagery of like babies and dogs and family and people eating and people getting served. Like as if you've, if you've ever seen a picture or pictures of like a wedding that's been held outside under, under a tree. Um, it's very similar to that. So a ton of images and a ton of video footage was shot around this scenario. And um, it went online, it got keyworded and Crate and Barrel um, bought bought a lot of the imagery for this campaign because it, it we, we listened to our client and listened to what they needed, created the imagery and put it online, um, not just for them, but for anybody that, that needed it. And it turned out that that was still, you know, it was still something that was in play that they needed the imagery for and they bought it. So that was basically an investment on the part of the Yeah, there are photographers who um, do put up money to, to create shoots um, and you know some people will do it just to do it for their own portfolio but a lot of photographers um, who work really hard to create their stock imagery um, will set aside either a certain amount of money or a certain amount of time to um, to create the work so they talk to their art directors or they look on the site and they look at um, the briefs and stuff that are up to see what kinds of imagery that's used and either they're going to invest like a small amount and have like you know, we need content of millennials and we need content of um, millennials of color, or, you know, having a party or whatever. And they maybe the only money that they'll invest in would be I'll order a bunch of pizza for my friends and have a bunch of my friends come and hang out and let them be what they're going to do what they're going to do. Or um, the shoot, I can tell you, this one down in the center, that was a real family that the photographer knew. Um, and he took them out for the afternoon and they did a whole bunch of different stuff. They packed up the car and pretended they were on vacation and they, they went out for burgers and, you know, he got, I think he got a property release from the, from the restaurant and just had them kind of be themselves and shot around that. Um, the lower left over there, um, you know, we hired some models. That was a shoot actually I did. And um, we got a couple of locations, got property releases from them and they just had them kind of pretend that they were you know, either real girls that were shopping, um, but we spent some money on, on doing it, maybe not tons, maybe, 
you know, it depends on, on where you are in the spectrum. I have photographers that I work with um, who will set aside, they make a plan to do four or five shoots a year. And they just say, I'm going to do this. And he'll come to me at the beginning of the year and say, you know, I, I'm planning my, my shoots. What are some subjects and things that I want to do? I know what his work already looks like and what kind of stuff he already does. And I'll give him some ideas based on brainstorms that we've had, ideas that I've seen come by. Um, I'll talk to my visual trends team, you know, if it's a very specific shoot, and say, well, what kinds of imagery do we need? You know, do we need close-ups of hands? Do we need, um, fam you know, what kind of imagery is a family? We need them, you know, eating, having a celebration, going on vacation. Sim simplistic stuff, but, you know, if you can take a really beautiful, iconic image of it, it, it could sell, you know. But again, there's no guarantee. We just kind of, we talk to our clients and we talk to, we, we talk to our research department because we parse out the information um, in terms of what people are researching, what, what kind of keywords people are looking for, and we try to fill what's in the, what's in the, what's missing in the collection. But there's certain things that just constantly need to be renewed because no matter how much you have, people are always going to want something new, something that's just come on the site that it's no, no one's ever used or whatever. Stuff like that. I kind of wanted uh, to see if, if you could elaborate a little bit more on this issue of the releases, either model or property uh -huh. releases. Like, um, you know, this image, for instance, of the man with his back turned, like if it wasn't for the girls, you know, if you can't see somebody's face or, you know, um, if whether like the clothes are recognizably of a certain brand or like if there's, you know, things like you, you talked about Crate and Barrel, so like the yes. furniture is a certain brand or something. Right. How, how, or it's anonymous. how detailed or... Uh, it has to be is, super is detailed. I mean, it, it really does. So like that center image, that boy probably had logos and stuff on his, stu on his shirt and on his skates, all removed in post. Um, the, the, the rule of thumb, I believe, is that if it's a street photo and it's a bunch of people and there's no one person that's the main subject, you're usually okay with that. Or if there's no one store or one brand, if there's like 10 different stores in the shot, it's fine. Or it's some local store, it's usually fine. But um, it's a case-by-case -case basis and we have people who inspect. If, it's not, if you're not working with an art director, you have, um, you know, we have, we have uh, teams of people who look at the work and make sure that it's technically released correctly. Um, but for the most part, we advise people to um, either remove logos, remove stuff um, from the shot. You know, not being recognizable is, is actually to be a little bit more than what you and I would think of as non-recognizable because the rule of thumb is more if you could recognize yourself, if that was you and you knew that was you, like if you're standing in front of the, in the Piazza Navona in Italy and I know that I was there on that day wearing those shoes and that outfit and like my mom would recognize me then you probably need a release for that person. But it's, you know, it depends. It depends on how the shot's set up. You know, if I were that close to someone, even if you're wearing a black shirt, I probably would still need a release. And so when you travel and, like, you're abroad somewhere and, uh, you know, is, is it the same applications? I mean, is it, is it I mean, laws? it's obviously it's harder in certain places. Um, and it's, like I said, it's always case by case. And sometimes we'll, there's, there's definitely on the collection, there's a lot of unreleased travel and unreleased stuff like that. Um, but again, the bottom line is, is it's not, not going to sell as much. It's not going to sell for as much money um, as something like a released image of like I have, uh, you know, one of the one of the things that we keep looking for is travel like a local is a, is, a, is a brief we keep giving to people, which is, you know, people who are traveling. It's kind of speaks to the Airbnb ad people who are traveling and not being tourists at the maps, but they're kind of like living there and they're like going to the market like the, that they saw on Anthony Bourdain and they're like going to the little crazy restaurant um, and they're really eating where the locals eat and all that stuff. But to show like a couple actually doing that or a person or a solo woman um, traveling on her own exploring and really getting immersed in the culture um, that's something you should plan out so you know I would say you're going somewhere with your girlfriend or your boyfriend and they'll sign a model release and you're gonna make them the subject you know and you can take a ton of pictures of that that kind of thing it's a simple it's I wouldn't tell that to someone who isn't going anywhere it becomes a huge production but I would say to someone who's already going somewhere here's a bunch of ideas that connect to travel that I might need that you might be able to make work I've another photographer who just went to Hong Kong and I gave him a whole list of stuff I hoped he was traveling with someone else and that he could maybe do some of these shots you know that have to do with being in an airport or whatever stuff like that we need a hand 
You need a reg. You need a real lo regular looking couple. The era of like model is really. We need real people of all shapes and sizes and ages and ethnicities. The more, the realer, the better. So uh, when stock photography first went from film to digital, there were all these requirements in terms of cameras and resolution. And are those still up there? We will take iPhone photos. I mean, we'll actually gladly take iPhone photos because as you see, this entire commercial that was made off of probably a lot of iPhones, yeah. um, you know, we accept it. I mean, it, what we offered, you know, if you really dig through the site and you look through the offering, especially in royalty free, you'll see things downloadable in certain sizes. And something that probably started off in an iPhone that wasn't set to the highest settings might not be offered in like 300 DPI, it'll only be offered in 172. Um, but th those are still viable because, like I said, people are looking for for imagery for their Instagram campaign or for their, you know, Facebook campaign or whatever. And like a lot of that lower imagery is totally usable. Okay. Not about a release. That's okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> that that for example, <clears throat> the uh, the ad the crate and barrel yeah. uh, shoot right. So shoot. it was shot. You know, you guys sort of had your hand in making that happen, right? I mean, from what I understand, it was more like we knew that they had come and talked to us about it. We knew that these were themes that are universally needed, like celebrations, family, that kind of stuff. And we created it. We didn't really say to Crate and Barrel, give us a bunch of stuff. We just like literally said, what would be the ideal beautiful family picnic? And we literally, I have a, there's a longer part of this presentation that um, includes like, a whole page of swipes and inspiration shots and how what kind of scene we want and what kind of models we want and then the whole sort of kind of shoot schedule so we basically more or less did this in four or five hours where you know they knew they wanted to have it done towards the end of the day they set up to have this dinner everyone came and they shot the whole thing like a wedding where it was like people were showing up people getting seated people greeting each other playing with the dog playing with the baby and we just shot the whole thing beginning right, my, to end my, my question though is Okay, so you, you got the images and it was mm -hmm. done. So where was it placed? In royalty free, or was it something that was? This was probably placed in rights managed. Right. Rights managed. Right. But you know, and then yeah. Then, then do you move things from rights managed over to royalty free? Is it the photographer? Occasionally, that can do that? I think if it doesn't, I think if it doesn't sell after a certain amount of time, it can move over. If the photographer decides they want to do it, they can. Um, you know, the 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 fact of the matter is, is rights managed market is pr very sort of is what it is. The royalty free market, there are so many clients coming in, there's so many new clients, and that's where the marketplace is happening right now. Right, right, okay. Yeah. Was this really crate and barrel furniture? No. <laughs> no. No, we didn't we didn't shoot it for them. We shot it for the collection and they what with their we knew that they wanted that kind of stuff. But we didn't like go to them and say we're going to do the shoot for you. We just did the shoot because we knew that beyond them, there were lots of other clients that were saying similar things. They wanted celebrations and family and you know stuff like that. Thank you so much, Claudia. Oh. Great presentation. Thank you.